Perfect. So with that, we'll officially get started with the wedgie, Way of the Wedgie curriculum workshop. Again, thank you all for joining. Uh, we have some people coming from all over the islands and also the world. We've got one from Newfoundland here. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping rules. So as you see, we've got Michelle. I will introduce her shortly. She, if you have any immediate or pressing questions, feel free to use the group chat and she will be monitoring and making sure that you guys don't have any issues technical wise or any pressing questions you may have about the curriculum. So with that, um, as it's being recorded, I may repeat some things here and there, uh, but we'll just move forward with that. Um, that being said, who we are, quick little introductions. So my name is Alana Johnston. I am the education and outreach specialist at Oikonos, um, and I also am a teacher. So I've been teaching at Pearl City for the last two years. I started teaching marine science, uh, which feeds very well into the way the wedgie curriculum, as well as biology. And again, this last year, I've taught some nursing services, but my favorite class by far is the marine science. Uh, I'll introduce Michelle Hester here real quick. We've got, she's the executive director. Hello, hi everybody, thanks for coming. She's the executive director and ecologist. Um, she is the one that's going to be moderating the group chat. Again, if you have any issues or anything tuned in right now, who you will meet shortly is Alyssa and David. Uh, they are seabird biologists. Uh, Alyssa is a master's student at HPU and David is an HPU professor. So you guys will meet them shortly with the seabird preserve tour. So we all welcome you and thank you for your interest and continued support. Next, I'll go into the workshop goals. So the main purpose, as you guys may have read or at least been interested in, are likely the well, Okani or the wedge-tailed shearwaters. Um, but the main purpose of this workshop is to give educators or anybody that's interested the confidence to actually implement the way the wedgie curriculum lessons. Um, and by proxy, we are hoping to inspire this excitement for conservation and the teaching in the STEM in different engaging ways. So it is a STEM plus art curriculum. We do try to incorporate in every way we can all of the different type of standards, which I will touch on later. But we really wanna emphasize that you don't have to be a certified scientist to actually make an impact and change. And that the way you can actually do it, the most important and potentially effective way is actually through education. So. Everybody is a conservationist, whether people want to rely on it or not, but everybody has an impact. So the workshop is to give you guys the confidence, the information, and the background to be able to confidently teach the future generations. And so the how, I'm going to give the background and the context and the knowledge and the story to each lesson plan. So each of the lesson plan packages, they are going to touch on certain scientific concepts very specific to the wedge tail shear water. And much of the feedback we've gotten from teachers that have implemented the lesson plans in the past is they want that a little bit of additional context to put into their lesson plans and then the story and like really make it personal. And the why is of course to foster generations that consider conservation and sustainability in their everyday lives. We see that a lot with the future generation. It goes well beyond just you know, trying to have your reusable straws, but it's actually really going into and making a difference and understanding the ecosystem and the world around you. So now that I've introduced the overall topics, um, next, and this is the way that we set it up with the lesson plans, I'm gonna go over a brief seabird and well, Akani overview before we go into the Freeman Seabird Preserve. We wanna give you guys enough background and knowledge and context. If you don't already know it, we never want to assume that you have that information because it's not always something that people know. So to really take in all of the information and the context of the preserve through the preserve tour, we're just gonna give you that brief overview of seabirds and the Ua'okani. And then we'll pass over the 
the lens to the Freeman Seabird Preserve. You guys will see where actually all of the data is taken from and all of these lesson plans take place. Next, we'll go into the lesson plan overview. So we'll go through the standards and each of the individual lesson plans. When it comes to questions and comments, I do ask that if you guys have very specific questions, we wanna open the floor to discussion on after each lesson plan, if you have any clarification questions. However, at the very end, we're gonna save larger discussion or maybe conceptual ideas to a question and discussion at the end. So if you have specific questions pertaining to these, maybe a little clarification, feel free at the end, we'll have like a little session, I'll double check that you guys all understand the context. And then at the very end, we'll have a questions and discussion after the conclusion. So with that, I'll go into the first lesson, that lesson being the introduction to the seabirds and much like our way of the wedgie program. What a lot of people don't know or understand are what seabirds actually are. I mean, the majority of the world don't live on the ocean. Some live on the coastal areas, none live on the ocean, but seabirds, they re rely entirely on the ocean for food. Then they spend the majority of their life at sea. So whether they're at sea flying or they're continuously just kind of moving around looking for food, they're always at sea. And then they only typically return to land to breed and nest. Some special adaptations that seabirds have acquired over the generations and evolution are waterproof feathers. They contain certain glands that they'll preen themselves and put these oils to make their waterproof feathers so that the salt water and everything doesn't affect their flying as well as when they dive into the ocean for food, they can come back up and very easily fly again. Of course, you've got webbed feet. You have last the specialized salt glands to expel and excess salt water. This is very specific to the tube noses, which I'll go into next, but some seabirds don't have this little gland here, but this is what makes them very specific and adaptable to staying out to sea for years at a time even. So here we've got, finally, the introduction of the Hawaiian Ua'akani also part of the tube nose family. So moving on and <clears throat> going more into depth with that. So the common name is the wedge-tailed shearwater. Uh, shearwaters belong to the family of these tube noses and they are a cousin to the albatross. The albatross is the type of bird that a lot of people typically associate with seabirds as being very charismatic. They are related and they have that little gland. Uh, however, the wedge-tailed shearwaters while we in the curriculum look specifically at the Ua Okani being the ones on Oahu, we have wedge-tailed shearwater species that are native to the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. So they are not currently endangered as they have a very wide range that they live in. However, we do find that their populations are declining over time, which is really pressing and very important. Other shearwaters in Hawaii include the Newell shearwater. They're state and federally listed as threatened. Um, their populations are steadily declining, and we've also got the Christmas shearwaters. So those three shearwaters reside on Oahu. Some additional Ua'ukani characteristics that make them the charismatic and fun and adorable little guys that we love. They have a very long lifespan, just like the albatross. They can live up to 30 years. Uh, they spend their first few years out to sea. So once they fledge and they actually take off from the preserve, they don't return to land for at least another three to five years. At this point, they're now at the breeding stage and they will then find a mate and come to the same nesting site every year. So much like sea turtles, I like to use this example, they return to the same nesting site that they were born at and then those instincts and natural areas kind of bring them back. Their survival strategy and resilience relies on their consistency and experience. You have, you find that the birds, they, like I said, come back to the same spot every year, but they also have the same mates every year as well. So much like anything else, you build a relationship, a communication, they build these relationship communications to become better parents and breeding pairs over the years. And this consistency of going back to the same area, as well as the same pairs, this creates that resilience for them to actually, you know, live and breed 
in the long term. So now that I've told you everything about the seabirds and the Ua'okani, so why are the seabirds so important? So of course we've got conservation practices, but they bring marine nutrients back to the ocean to naturally fertilize the plants through their guano. This is a very important nitrogen source for a lot of coastal communities. They are also incredibly cultural significant in Hawaii. So traditional Polynesian navigators or wayfinders, they observe seabird behavior and specific seabirds as they're wand not wandering, but they as they're navigating the ocean, there are specific seabirds that only go beyond certain areas of land. So by seeing a certain seabird, one being the Manu Oku, they find the Manu Oku and they know that they're within a certain time frame of reaching land. And then that direction will then lead them to the right area. Seabirds in general are also incredibly important to even today fishermen. So seabirds will follow and find schools of fish. These are called fish balls and they will create and they find where the tuna push all of the smaller fish to the surface that then attracts the seabirds, which then go forward and fishermen find those seabirds flocking above the school of fish to where they can go, then go and then get the best catch. So before I hand off to tour the preserve, I do want to include one more cultural significant portion and also show you guys what the Uokani sounds like. So part of the reason their name, the Hawaiian name is Uokani is they have a very distinct almost moaning call. It can be quite off-putting if you don't know what it is, but there are legends that as people were becoming closer to the island, um, not necessarily wayfinders, but non-Polynesians, they would come closer to the islands and these moaning, these calls sounded as if they were ghosts or some sort of demon or something that they didn't really want to mess with, which would actually deter them from going to the islands. So I'm gonna pull up a quick video. That video just being. <laughs> so you can hear that really intense kind of long loping sound. It's very distinctive to the wedge tail shear runners. We won't play that the entire time, but hopefully at the preserve, you actually might be able to hear some of the wedge-tailed shearwaters potentially calling to each other. So the lesson plans as a whole, they're meant to be flexible. So they're supposed to be able to guide to your standards and your expectations. Um, so each of them, and I'll go over that in the next few slides, uh, how they're actually set up, but the curriculum standards were created to fit the next generation science standards, as well as the Hawaii content and performance standards. They're specifically aimed for sixth to eighth grade. However, there are adaptations to ninth to twelfth. So like I said, I taught, taught and teach at Pearl City High School. I taught marine science and my marine science students were 11th to 12th grade. So I was able to create some of the discussion and the activities to be more at their level so that they're actually thinking a little bit more conceptually on some of the topics. But again, if you're looking for just having those standards met in your certain curriculum, we have a detailed outline on the website as well of all of the different benchmarks and activities and which ones meet those expectations. So if you have any questions or comments about those after, um, I'm welcome and I'm around and available to always email you about any questions you might have on that as well. Um, so excuse me, Elena, would you like to turn your video on? Oh, whoops, my bad. <laughs> Hello again. Thought it had been on. All right, so with the curriculum standards, we'll now move on. If you guys want to pull up the website on your phone or your laptop or anything that you would like to see, this is just kind of a for reference for you guys to look at later. 
Um, all of the lessons are there. So I'm going to actually share my screen and show you guys the website as well. So if you don't want to pull it up on your own phone, I will do the little share screen over here and give you guys an overview of how you can actually use the website and how it's set up. So let's go here. Can you guys see that screen? Yes, it's good. All right. So here we have this website is run and operated by the Hawaii Audubon Society. Uh, so they have everything about the information, meet the birds, restoration, research, and lessons. I won't go into that for this workshop, but I'll show you guys exactly where to go to lessons. So if you press those lessons there, you'll go into the way of the wedgie. If you guys do plan on implementing this in the classroom, we do ask that if you have the time to please fill out this survey. These, this information helps us get grants and then funding to continue doing more re webinars as well as create more information and resources for you guys to use. So if you guys have the opportunity to use that, we please ask that you're able to fill that out. So as you guys scroll down, there's a quick overview of each of the lesson plans. You've got studying seabirds on land, population monitoring, the restoring a seabird colony, habitat restoration, so conservation, and then how we actually were able to restore the Freeman Seabird Preserve. Staying alive, we'll go into that, which is more of a game of survival. It's a physical game that we actually created some dice that you guys are able to play with. But it also goes into all of the different threats that the seabirds have. Next is the designing the nest. This is the portion that we have a lot of information given back to us that they feel as if they don't have enough information to implement like the science of the birds. And this is all located in this section here. This is often overlooked. This presentation here is actually part of the lesson plan. And here you'll find the lesson plan overview and standards. So this will lead you to a shared Google Drive where I'll show you guys how you're actually going to access those lesson plans and resources. So if you were to click that, it will lead you to that drive. If for whatever reason you wanna actually go through and edit I'll show you how to do that as we go through the next, but here's all the standards. Next, each of the sections, you'll see a teacher's resource and then a student's handouts and activities resource. Under the teacher's resource, you'll have all of the PowerPoints as well as the keys. There may not be as many under the teacher's resources because the student handouts will often be qualitative. Those qualitative ones don't necessarily need a key. Uh, so it's just whether or not you decide to do a more form formative or summative assignment on that. But again, just going more into depth, the way you access that, very similar. We have a page, we've outlined it. So you've got lesson one. I'll go into what the five E's are if you guys aren't already familiar. But the order that they're meant to be put in, however, the lesson plans as a whole, they're supposed to be very flexible to you. So you're able to take, if you wanted to just do the engage lesson plan, you can only do the, you only have to do that one. They're best paired together as well as best paired in order. So we have that flexibility for you to make it whatever it is you want it to be in your classroom. So whether you want to use the whole unit, which is what I did in my marine science class as a whole course that lasted a few weeks, or if you wanted to use it as a supplement to other uh, lessons and portions that you're going through. So you've got, say, population monitoring, something that is a whole section in the biology. You could use parts of this lesson, edit out what you want and what you don't want, go from there. So the way you would do that, so you'll open up the lesson. This is the PowerPoint. Oops, yeah, we don't want the PowerPoint. That there is the lesson. This is the key. If you're going to go through, it's the same principle for the student version, which has the name and then a period at the top. Again, you can edit that to be whatever you like. So just go to file and then download. You don't wanna make a copy because the copy will go back into that same drive. So you actually want to download that in whatever format it is that you want. So that is how you operate the website.
you'll have each of the different, again, teacher's resource and student handouts, as well as the quick overview of what each of the lessons are. I won't go over them now because we're going to go over them later in this webinar. All right, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen over here. in the PowerPoint. So as you guys saw, if you're not already familiar, we base the curriculum on the five E's. So it's meant to go again in that order. However, you can take those lesson plans and individually assess whether you just wanna do the, the PowerPoint as an informational session to introduce maybe conservation practices elsewhere or just do the explore if you wanna go into more different details, but I'll go into what each of these themes are for all of the lesson plans. So every lesson will have an engage portion. This engage is always the PowerPoint. This is meant to provide the new knowledge, context and definitions that you will need for the students to successfully understand as well as start to critically think as a scientist in that mindset what sort of information they need to move on to the lessons. For the explore, the explore is typically in all of them very data oriented. So this is where the actual data that we've taken and collected from the preserve is put into a lesson plan and we practice a lot of those math standards. So there's a lot of analyzing as well as graphing. There's some minor type statistical analysis and that's where it becomes maybe more at the high school grade level. And those are able to, we have different adaptations for how difficult or easy you might want them to be. Next, we go on to the explain. This again is best done with Explore, but you're going to explain the results. This is again, flexible to your needs. If you want to have the students work individually, they can create or write up a paper or just answer the questions accordingly. You could do a pair and share. So have the students describe their different results from Explore and maybe some different conclusions they will have had or do a guided discussion through the classroom. Next, we have the elaborate. So this is where students begin to explore their unanswered questions. So less about actually breaking down the scientific data and more about describing what it is that they don't quite understand through the worksheet. And then last, we have evaluate. This is the most flexible in terms of your grading and assessments. So this gives the students an opportunity to learn everything or show that what they've learned through all of the different learning cycles in one section. So I'll describe how each of those feed back into the lesson plans. But the curriculum package purpose as a whole by implementing these five E learning cycle is you want to elicit the students ideas as if they were actually scientists from the preserve. So you want the students to feel like they actually are the researchers and not just doing a worksheet for the sake of doing the worksheet. So you want them to actually recognize that this is real data taken from the preserve and actually see and make conclusions on the preserve as it's currently and technically yeah, currently happening. You also will be giving the students good practice. So science practices and concepts. So like we said, drawing conclusions from certain data sets, different analysis, as well as creating solutions and ideas that might help and foster the overall health of the ecosystem. And if you are based in Hawaii, this is a Aina based curriculum for Hawaii schools. Uh, there are a lack of resources for very locally based and native species, specifically in the science uh, curriculum. So we aim to include a more comprehensive INA based curriculum for Hawaii teachers. But this is again, very adaptable as just general seabird research globally as well. It's just as important to emphasize this research being done globally as well. Does anybody have any questions on that before I move on to the specific lesson plans? All right, so with that, we'll go into lesson plan one. So lesson plan one focuses on population monitoring. So this is specifically on how we as researchers and seabird biologists understand and actually evaluate the success or the fall of population on the preserve. 
Um, so understanding the general life cycle is the first portion of implementing this, license, this lesson plan. If the students don't have a good understanding of how the seabirds breed, when they come back to breed, and what actually is the indicators of success, they won't be able to actually implement and create conclusions from that data. So that data is to analyze and interpret. So they're going to take evidence from the phenomena that being us actually looking and checking the nests and then being able to see and going to quantify how successful the preserve is. And that's through nest checks. And then again, through the nest success. So that's the engage, explore, explain. And then finally, the students should be able to infer these different conclusions on the overall health of the colony through these data sets and also being able to understand their life cycle and seeing how those two correlate. So this is the end life cycle activity. This one is perhaps the most important in terms of terms. So up here I included what is population monitoring. So it may seem quite straightforward, but it's the consistent and repeated observations to detect, measure, assess, and evaluate different species and ecosystems. So an example that I like to use in the classroom is every time you go to the doctor, you take your health and your vitals. So every time that you go there, there should be a level that should be standard, the standard that is what's normal and healthy. If one time you go to the doctor and something's very off and something spiked, that's going to then have a flag for the doctor and then other medical professionals to begin to look in to try to diagnose what's wrong and then fix that problem. Same with the population monitoring. If there were to be a massive drop in the population, either, whether it be in the eggs or maybe it was the chicks fledging. There might've been the same amount of eggs, but for some reason, half the amount of chicks fledged. That gives us at least an indicator of where to start looking in the population and what happened for us to draw conclusions of what to do and better manage. So some terms and definitions to know going into the lesson plan. Uh, some of these may be self-explanatory, but it's worth noting before going into. I'll start over here with the overall kind of life cycle. So you've got the egg laying period. I included this table here. Uh, it's included in the lesson plans and it can be kind of confusing once you begin looking at it. So I wanted to break down the main terms and definitions using this figure. So you have the egg laying period. So the range of days that all birds lay their eggs, that's in July. So you see there the arrow going towards July. That's the point that we're at now. So at this point, all of the eggs should be laid in that time period there. Next, we'll have the chick provisioning period. So this being that April to October, more or less also June, but this chick provisioning, this is once all the chicks are more or less actually hatched and thriving, and we can actually monitor the health of them individually. So again, the population monitoring, something that we do at the preserve and have been conducting since 2009, we regularly go through and we actually check a certain amount of chicks and then weigh them and check them for their health on a weekly basis. So this again is supposed to help us if there were to be some issues in the preserve, we can then identify and help manage and mitigate that. Next, we go on to fledging. Fledging is a term that is not commonly used, but we like to really emphasize in the lesson plans. This is when birds leave the nest for the first time and actually are on their own as young adults. So they're a fully developed chick. And then for shearwaters, this is when they actually first fly out to sea. So the official fledging is not just them kind of playing with their wings, it's when they actually actively fly out to sea. For the purpose of this lesson plan, we have active nests and inactive nests. Active nest is just that there's a live egg or chick and an inactive nest. So when we go through and create these, here we go on, on to the next one, these censuses, we actually will label all of the nests as active or inactive and we'll compare those two numbers to determine how the health of the ecosystem is functioning as a whole. Now we'll go into just again, a more visual representation of the sheer water life cycle. So in March, the birds start arriving, they begin looking for their mates. If they are a younger pair, they'll find their first time mates. If they are an older pair, they'll actually attempt to find that same pair from before. So they do mate for life. Of course, if something happens to that pair, they will then look for another mate at that time. April to May, the parents, 
and their pairs will secure a nest site and they'll go on that extended foraging trip. That being for about that whole month, both of the parents are going to go out to sea for a month to try to fatten up and then really build up their supply in order to build and raise that chick. So we've got June to July, which is where we're at now, which is the egg laying and incubation period. I'd like to make a quick note on the July 14th egg count. Since 2009, once a year, well, twice a year, once a year, we end July 14th, the same day every year, we go and have an egg count. So we know on average that there are about 800 birds or 400 eggs per year that is steadily increasing. The way that we know that is every year we go with a group of volunteers and ourselves, and we try to find and locate and count every single egg on the preserve. Then you've got down into the chicks hatching period. So you go to August in between the chick hatching and the chick provisioning period on September 14th. This is the point where all of the chicks that are going to be more or less successful ha will have hatched and we go through do the exact same thing that we did during the egg laying incubation period. That being we go through and we find every lives or active nest chick. And then that is what we compare the July to the September. That is the nest check. So that is the engage part of portion of this. So you'll compare those two data sets and then create analysis and conclusions off of those. And then next you'll go into the explain. So the explain is where the nest success. So you'll use different data sets of the monthly population monitoring to determine how successful each year was compared to the July and the September 14th. So it combines all of that information into one. So now we'll go into why is it important? Of course, as I mentioned, wildlife population monitoring, it helps give an indicator of the overall health of the ecosystem. And then this helps the allocation of land management. So if it weren't for the birds going to the preserve in the first place, Freeman Seabird Preserve would never have actually been an area. So to understand the distribution of the wildlife populations at a healthy, so taking those healthy and stable, you know, vital signs, we're able to compare that on a yearly basis to determine and collect that information to make sure that the wildlife monitoring these species don't become endangered. Uh, we're asked all the time, are these species endangered? And they're not yet. And we would really like to keep it that way. And one way that we do that is through population monitoring. Something worth noting, this is the end of one of our uh, sessions. This is the Oikonos group and staff. We this year had 427. So again, every year we have a new record of eggs. We had 427 this year, July of 2023. So we're very proud and excited that every year we have continued to have success. And it's just quite nice. Uh, any questions on lesson plan one specifically? before I move on to lesson plan two. All right, so I'll just go on the lesson plan two. So now that we have established how we actually monitor populations, the lesson plan two focuses specifically on the habitat restoration. So what is it that we actually went into to create Freeman Seabird Preserve? So the goal of this lesson is to understand the background and the history and importance of the habitat restoration of Freeman Seabird Preserve. Uh, it was briefly mentioned in our field tour. However, I'll touch on those as well here because it was difficult to hear. So you'll also be able to understand that success in habitat restoration can happen on small scale and create very successful overall impacts. Next, we want to introduce the various nest types. So we were able to actually show you guys majority of the nest types at the preserve. So we'll go into each of the different types that are at the preserve. I won't go as much into them because we were able to see a decent amount, as well as talk about overall ecosystem biodiversity. And this is the introduction to some predator threats. So again, like before, the engage is always the presentation. It gives you all the background terms and definitions everything that you need to know to kind of move forward with the present with the lesson plan. So then we'll go into nest preferences. So how different birds choose their nests uh, and then explain and elaborate. You'll have the house hunters. So the wedgetail shearwater is actually choosing, comparing and contrasting the different nest types. And then last you have the, you're quantifying the overall success. Uh, we don't go into the specific 
portions because we're a little tight on time today, but of each of these, but I do touch on like the overall main points of these goals. So first we've got the restoration timeline of Freeman Seabird Preserve. I'm not sure if you're able to hear, but it was donated in 2007 from the Freeman family and gifted to Hawaii Audubon Society. And this is specifically for the protection of the Ua Ukani. It was through the Hawaii Audubon Society that we have created that partnership and we have fostered a relationship for quite a while to not only like foster and create this environment for the Ua Ukani, but also to manage and research them for all this time. Starting in 2008, we started the habitat restoration and that was just as simple as just taking out invasive plants and getting it to a point that we could actually introduce some more native species. And as you can see here, so we started the restorations in 2008, but it wasn't until 2010 that we started out planting. In 2009, to kind of give that control portion, we took that first total census. So we include that in the data in a lot of the lesson plans. This is a very heavily emphasized in the lesson plan too. So the first population census in 2009 is what we first started the counts and we have seen a steady increase ever since. We directly correlate that back to the successes and the work that we've put into Seaman, Freeman Seabird Preserve. So that 2010, so first year we actually started creating those artificial rock piles. So that was the second bird that we had seen. The first one was located in the artificial tile nest. The second one is just areas of rock pile that we strategically created to make little nesting areas for the birds to go into. And this is where we started the outplanting. I'll go into specific types of plants that we introduced that are highlighted at the preserve, but in the PowerPoint, there are a series of plants that you're welcome to also research and go more into depth with about why they're important to Hawaii in general. So 2013, this is when we started the construction and installation of the tile and brick. So this is the first wedgie that we saw. So this is the one with the tile where we got the reconstructed materials and we created those little homes and those little nests for them. Starting in 2018, we got the funding and the collaboration with the Hawaii Windward Community College and began the construction and installment of the ceramic nest. This was the one that you actually take the lid off. It had those louvers to give a, a cooler temperature overall, and that's talked about in lesson plan four, so we'll go more into detail on that. In 2022, we had a huge success being that that was the first year that all 14 ceramic nests were occupied. So every shearwater that chose to lay an egg there was there and we actually had 100% success in a egg. And as of this year, like I said, new record nest count every year, we're having some sort of new feat that we've accomplished. And it just shows how successful Freeman Seabird Preserve has been. So some of the highlighted conservation efforts, uh, we only chose two of these. So we got the Nalpaca. I wanna quickly highlight this photograph here. This was done by a local artist, Patrick Ching. Uh, he does a beautiful job at including and incorporating an entire ecosystem and fitting it into one page or one canvas, essentially. So you've got all of the different types of native species. The two that we have highlighted over here are the, this is the, oh, the Nalpaca in this corner, and then the Ojai in this corner. You got the beach morning glory. I'm trying not to get that little tab here, but the beach morning glory down at the bottom as well as the shearwaters. Seabirds do tend to flock. So those bird balls, you've got the Eva, you got the red-tailed tropic birds, and then the wedgies surrounding the, the bird ball. And you've got the islands in the background and bringing together the whole ecosystem. But the Napaka in particular, we had that one bird that was nesting in the bush. So this creates more native and natural habitat for the shearwater specifically. It's also a great resource to increase coastal resilience. So this prevents soil erosion. It's a great material to just have as a land cover. It's also very culturally significant. I'm not going to go into it in this presentation, but there are a lot of culturally significant Hawaiian stories associated with the Nalpaka. One of the other incredibly highlighted species is the Ohai. So the Ojai is a, 
currently endangered or threatened plant species on Oahu. Uh, they're one of the few remaining endemic species. So you've got native, so plants that are just native to the area, but also native to other areas in the world. The ohai is endemic, meaning that it's specifically found this species in Hawaii. And this species is really struggling to thrive due to invasive species, as well as all of the urban development happening around it. However, we have had success with multiple areas of the ohai and even birds nesting in the ohai as well. Uh, on our last count, there were more than a few that had eggs and actually hatching in there. And if you didn't know, quick little fun fact, Hawaii is actually known as the extinction capital of the world. So it is an area with a lot of endemic species. And unfortunately, um, a lot of these species have declined and or gone extinct. Um, and this is something that we continuously find throughout Hawaii. So moving on, why is this one important? Uh, adding these why these important slides are to give you guys a better idea of how to begin the discussion and context. So habitat restoration offers wildlife the safe and comfortable environment for them to easily and accessibly go back to every year to successfully breed. By incorporating these native plants, you increase the overall biodiversity, not only of the islands, but also globally. So by having more, not necessarily niche, but endangered species, you're gonna increase the overall biodiversity, which supports the overall ecosystems. Quick little water break. And Freeman Seabird Preserve, it shows that you don't need thousands of acres to effectively influence wildlife management. We have one acre and that brings back 800 birds every year. So this really shows that even in your yard or any time that you're going on a hike, <laughs> sorry, quick little, little, little cough, um, so this shows that you can also make a difference. So making sure that you don't introduce invasive species and giving those native species a chance to thrive and live as well as going and out planting. So I've got different plants just around my apartment that are native species and I'll put them outside sometimes to act as pollinators. Are there any questions on Lesson plan number two. So that's completing the importance of lesson plan number two and the habitat restoration efforts. Sorry for a little coughing fit. <clears throat> All right, so we'll move on to lesson plan three. So the overall lesson plan package overview this one is by far one of the most popular of the lesson plans. So this incorporates all of the different dangers and threats of the preserve. It's meant to give the students an idea of what conservation solutions are to prevent the unnecessary deaths to the shearwaters. Here I have a quick little information kind of session of temperature. So we went over, I'm gonna have another. <laughs> oh, sorry. So <clears throat> different threats to shearwaters. We went over some of them briefly on the tour, but this gives students an idea of what conservation solutions are needed to prevent unnecessary deaths to shearwaters. One of the most important parts of preventing these unnecessary deaths is education and outreach. So us doing information and sessions such as this to show you guys the different types of threats that shearwaters go through and how they're different from us, as well as how we monitor and manage these different threats. So we've got the engage, again, the PowerPoint. We have the interactive game. This is something that's very popular among many of the students. Conservation brainstorming. So allowing the kids the opportunity to try to come up with different ways that they can help and foster the wedgies. Then we go on to elaborate. So staying alive. This is a very specific kind of, it's a similar population census. And this is, you look at the specific threats and then how we can measure that success over time at the colony. But for the sake of time a little bit, I'm just gonna go into the two different types of threats and then briefly a little game overview. 
So like we mentioned before, we have land-based threats. There's rats, mongoose, cats, and off-leash dogs. And more recently, we have barn owls. The mongoose and barn owls were both actually introduced species to prevent the rats and then the mitigation of the rats. And unfortunately, both of those species have become more or less maybe potentially more of a problem than the rats themselves. In Hawaii, we do have a problem with a lot of feral cats. They just do tend to go rampant and as well as off-leash dogs. So this poses a hazard and a threat to the birds by killing them. Artificial light. So artificial light, like sea turtles, um, when the chicks fledge, they are nocturnal. So they fledge at night. They go towards the light of the moon to direct them towards the ocean. And unfortunately, in such urban areas, there's a lot of artificial light. This pollution causes fallout and fallout means when the birds go towards that light, they end up falling on the ground. And then once they get on the ground, because they're seabirds, they don't have that strength and that ability to just get themselves up and off the ground again. This causes them to sometimes fall on the roads, which is very detrimental and people don't always notice them. Again, it's nocturnal, so it's at night and they get hit by cars quite often. They're then more susceptible to, again, the rats, mongoose, cats. They are the still young fledglings, so they're still learning how to be birds. And this artificial light fallout is quite detrimental to their population. Then you have habitat loss and development. This is very specific to Freeman Seabird Preserve, but is seen all over the islands as well as the world. So humans stepping on the nests, nests on properties. So just because we have the seabird preserve doesn't mean all the birds go there. You'll have the nests going to certain areas where people might not be as kind to the shearwaters or areas where they might not know that they're there. And then when they actually take apart, say their, their wall or anything that they're working on in their yard, it may then damage the eggs or the chicks or potentially push the adults away. Next, we got marine threats, something that people are probably very familiar with at this point. There's marine debris and entanglement. So you've got ingestion, you've got fishery bycatch. So the bycatch of them being the birds actually going into the fishing gear and or just entanglement of that. So as they dive down, they might dive into the fishing gear, become entangled and drown. You got plastic pollution. This is bad in two ways. So the plastic is either fed to the chicks and is not ingested, and then they eventually and slowly may start to death. It also has negative effect on fish populations. So if the birds don't have enough sustenance and energy to come back to land to breed, they will simply skip that breeding year, meaning that we're left out on that many more birds going back into the ecosystem. Same thing with ocean pollution. That's going to negatively affect fish populations back into the overfishing, limited fish supply, the less fish we have, the less birds will have fall down effect. Climate change, this will influence migration patterns of both fish and birds. Um, as you get higher heat, uh, the different channels and the way that the fish move throughout the ocean are going to change in time. And this is going to change the overall migration patterns and also lead to less food or fish in the ocean. A way that we want to conceptualize this through the students, we actually have a little game. So this demonstrates the student's life cycle and then it also challenges and shows the challenges that all of the seabirds have. So this incorporates all of the different challenges that they'll have as well as the life stages. So it puts together lesson plan one in the introduction as well as all of the different challenges. So you can see in this photo, there's the human interaction station each station will send you to a different station as a result of an action. That action may be negative, so they might not have enough food for that year, and it may send them back to the ocean station. That ocean station may continue to have pollution, lack of food, lack of resources, and the chick may eventually die, or that fledging may eventually die. We have a outlined worksheet for the students to keep tally of their birds and then see how successful their birds are over time. And then that's an accurate representation. We've tried to make it as accurate as possible to the percentages of birds that actually do survive. Um, it's a game, so it's meant to be fun. Uh, here we have just a little overview of us doing it at a event. It's just in the single line, so you can't see the setup quite too well. But you can do this in a classroom where you set it up all over. 
And the point is, so the students are able to go to the different stations and see that not every life cycle of the birds are exactly the same. Sometimes they'll skip a breeding cycle, other times they may go back and sometimes they're just successful through and through. It's just a fun way for the students to conceptualize and like see themselves as a bird at the preserve. Any questions on that one? So that's it as the lesson plan three. Then we'll have one more. We've touched on a lot of the topics of lesson plan four. So that will be a very brief one before we open up for discussion. Any questions on three? All right, I'll move on. So last but not least, we have lesson plan four. So while the game of survival is probably one of the most popular ones in classrooms, this lesson plan is actually my favorite and was the most engaging for me to include in my classroom. So this one is designing a nest, so conservation solutions. This overview lesson plan, uh, you have to put together all of the information that you have from the other lesson plans. Again, it can be standalone, but this is actually one of the lessons that is best implemented with at least one other package as well. At a minimum, if not with the package, you'll have to adequately introduce through the PowerPoints and describe that story to the students for this to be very successful. So the students will design a nest and they'll go through different levels of that design process and they will be able to actually try to put together and conceptualize what it is that needs to go into the creation of a nest for it to be successful. So they'll have to consider threats, human impact, seabird biology, and then at the end they'll be able to contrast and compare how these different climate change solutions can fit into not only their nest but also into different nests that maybe seabird biologists are creating in the future. So I'll just go forward with that. So as you can see, we've got our little nest, our ceramic nest that we had here. I have a representation of water going off of it. But this is where we blend the science and the art. So this is where you have the opportunity to really get artistic with your kids and get them to try to conceptually think and have fun with actually creating a nest in a home for the birds. So for us and in this specific design, we collaborated with the California College of Arts, as well as Oikonos scientists to create that design. And then we collaborated again with Windward Community College to actually create the, the units and the homes themselves. The material that we chose was ceramic clay. So again, in the presentation, Michelle walked you guys through that. We tried to make it look as natural as possible. So as you can see here, we've got like that sort of lighter rock. We wanted that rock and that feel to be similar or this clay to be similar to that rock and feel. We also wanted it to be light enough to reflect light because it's a very good temperature control uh, material. So it prevents the inside from not only getting too hot but also from the birds from getting too cold. So once the chicks are left on their own, uh, they will be alone from their parents while they're going out to find food. Sometimes it can get quite cold in Hawaii, so it keeps them warm from the day as well as cold throughout the night. So it's a very great temperature control material. It's also both sustainable and natural. So it's sturdy enough, like we said, the wood we didn't want to use because it was too, it degrades a bit faster and the clay will eventually degrade back into the natural area and we don't have to actually do anything to mitigate it, but it is also a sustainable material in general. So the next I'm going to go into this was the, this is an overview of how you're going to have the explore and explain. So the actual data. So the keeping it cool, the data, the explore portion of this lesson plan, you're going to look at the impacts of climate change at Freeman Seabird Preserve, use the ceramic nest as an example, and then test that in three different areas. So they tested it, well, they tested it largely in the temperature and we te temperature gauged it in the shade as well as in the sun. But when we created it, like I said, we had to use it as against protection of the weather, human impacts, as well as natural threats. So the way in which that we kept it cool was through the louvers as well as the ceramic clay nests. And in the keeping it cool, you're going to look at the data analysis of two control groups. So this is where you're actually going to implement different science concepts in the classroom. So you're going to look at a control in the shade as well as control in the sun. 
and you're going to look at the temperature of the inside the ceramic nest in the shade as well as in the sun and you'll compare analyze and then actually create a statistical analysis and conclusions on which was more successful and how successful it was in terms of maintaining temperatures in different environments on the preserve. So then you'll be able to put together all of that information at the end, bringing it together there for the students to create their own nests and their own homes for birds. So this brings together all of the information from all of the lesson plans, as well as just included in the different threats. And then this lesson plan of how to create a home for the birds. So you'll have to have accessibility, predator prevention and climate control. So we've touched pretty heavily on the climate control and how those different types of materials is meant to mitigate being too hot, too cold. You got predator, predator prevention. Of course, it's not a complete predator proof fence. So students will have to try to brainstorm and think above and beyond to try to mitigate unnecessary deaths as well as accessibility. So it is a seabird preserve that regularly is monitored by scientists. So you'll have to consider different accessibility options to not only have the researchers go in to the, to the nest, but also so that you don't negatively impact the birds too much either. So these are actually nests created by my students. So this was Pearl City High School, their wedgie shelters. These are some of the ones that were, I, that spoke to me the most. Some of them they had very similar to the ceramic nests. Um, they had the tubes um, and then I thought this one was cute. They actually made sure that the birds fit different materials. So the students had attempted different materials. It's encouraged throughout the lesson plan that you actually try to use reusable materials. You don't go out and buy additional materials. So it's trying to do the reduce, reuse, recycle. So going out, trying to make it a challenge to see who can use the, the least amount of resources and be the most successful as well. It's the most integrative and hands-on of the lesson plans. And it really lets the kids put together and think and conceptualize everything they've learned into a single concept and a physical project. So this design is these two are very similar. And then this one, I really liked how they use the different materials to their advantage as well. So that being said, we have touched on all of the different lesson plans. I know it was sitting through a lot, but I wanna thank you guys so much for just being interested in the way of the wedgie as a whole. And if you guys have any questions or do end up implementing it, uh, please let us know. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor to general questions and discussions. So feel free to ask me any questions about the lesson plan, Alyssa, David, Michelle, about the birds themselves. Um, if you just wanna to talk to us about what it is that brought you here, we'll just spend the rest of the time discussing. I hope you guys liked the presentation. I know it was a lot of talking, but I hope that it gives you guys enough information to adequately implement these lesson plans into your classroom as well as give you guys a little bit more context of what it's actually like at the preserve for the seabirds, as well as for the research, and then how successful it actually has been. So I hope at a minimum, you guys learned a few things today and are inspired to hopefully give back, volunteer with the communities, and learn more about wedge-tailed shearwaters. Thank you. So I'll officially open this up to discussion. I have a question. Uh, I was just wondering if you guys bring students to the preserve uh, and what that looks like in different capacities. Do you, do you ever have high school students collecting data or volunteering? Um, and then uh, are you guys doing field trips or anything like that? Yeah, so actually um, here in this photo, uh, these two, this photo here, these two, my students weren't able to make it, but we did have a field trip at the preserve with Pearl City High School. And so this was taken, they brought their nest to the preserve and we took the photo and we tested how successful they would be. So yeah, we do have the resources to have students out. We have had the nature center come out and we do really want to start bringing more children out the preserve. We have regular volunteer days that people can come and attend. So once the chicks are all gone, we have people that can come out and learn more about the restoration efforts, do invasive species removal, 
um, but we're also looking to do different integrative sessions in the classroom. So we're hoping to take the lesson plan and then maybe even bring Wilma, if you remember Wilma, into the classroom with you guys. So there's a lot of flexibility in what we would like to do with the preserve. Um, are you looking at doing maybe a field trip at the preserve? Uh, I I work at Kilauea Point National Wildlife Refuge in oh, yeah. Hawaii, and so I'm just kind of thinking, like, you know, what can we do here? What have you guys been successful at? Um, you know, just to to get ideas of, uh, you know, what might be possible. How can we use the resources you guys have already created and um, kind of expand our reach and collaborate? Yeah. Um, I will ask David. I'm not sure if they're still There's... here. Davi, yes. do Davi, do you want to explain to Laurel the fun the fun program you did with Iolani that might work good for Kilauea Point, where the students followed the chicks and then came out to meet them? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so we, I don't know if you guys can see me, but anyway, we, um, what we did is we students. Uh, out here and each student was following one chick and basically we had two groups we had natural versus ceramic nests they had some questions we had to evaluate how well the chicks did overall compared with other years in the past and then whether living in a ceramic or a natural rock home made a difference to survival and growth rates those were the the tasks the students had and then, you know, uh, every student got assigned one bird in one of the two types of homes. And once a week, I would send them the weight and size of their chick. And they had all the data for their birds and additional birds. They could com make comparisons, do some graphs. As part of that, I met with them three times via Zoom, where we talked about first the metrics that we use, how to interpret them, then how to look at averages and anomalies and deviations and change over time, and then how to actually make comparisons of different groups of data. So I thought it was a really fun experience because they got to sort of compete against each other to see what chick. And, and also there was a, a really a science-based question underneath that they got to answer. Um, the wrap up of this uh, experience is that they came and then they got to meet their own chicks. And that was really, for me, was so rewarding. They were so excited. They had all named their chicks, you know. I remember how one, one student said, I want to meet Geraldine, Geraldine, where's Geraldine? I'm like, who's Geraldine? Uh, you know, W5, what G5? And we met, she met Geraldine and they all made beautiful drawings. And I mean, they were so enamored of their little birds you know it was awesome um anyway so just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we can do mixing you know virtual and maybe a visit and you know giving them real data that every week gets updated right so they can really follow what's going on that sounds like such a cool project yeah so um I mean, we're doing this every fall. We collect the data. It's just really straightforward. You know, if you, uh, we can hook up, you tell me how many students you have. I'll give you some, you know, a summary of week by week, and then we can have some Zooms or, you know, however it works. And let, let's do it. That'd be really, really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. They, they also probably monitor some, they can monitor some nests at Kilauea Point. Oh, that'd so be really great. Yeah. yeah. That would be really, really fun. Yeah, we can, you know, we can share our protocols are really straightforward, really simple. Um, you may need to, yeah, um, I'm sure have a, a wildlife refuge person with you, you know, but but it's great. And we do fun things like, you know, if the student gets put down, it's extra credit points. So that way they're fearless, you know, they're not worried about getting dirty. Anything. Um, you know, and then uh, Alisa and I also have a competition who gets put more and she beat me last year. <laughs> she got put way more than me. So I have to increase my uh, my poop exposure this year. Can I hear if there's any other, other teachers in the audience that um, are thinking about implementing part of this.
It also could just be general educators as well. I mean, what is it that maybe if you guys want to just kind of chat a little bit longer, like what is it that made you interested in this? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, if I may, that you know, if, if different teachers are interested in implementing part of it and going through, um, it would be really fun to at the end of the of the experiences in different classes to maybe have a virtual session together where we, um, I would be really happy to, you know, uh, run something like that where we get pair what different classes found or how the results compare, come up with. So, um, you know, either that or we could have um, a virtual presentation or in person if you're here before to motivate the activities, you know, those things are really, really great. Thanks. Um, So Enrisa or Alex um, said they would like to bring it to Kilauea School on Kauai. So that would be great. You could uh, incorporate stuff about the Newells, of course, too, um, and make some comparisons between Newells and Wedgetail Shearwater since you have both of them accessible. And uh, and also the, the SOS program for the fallout courses have a lot more information about the, the Newells. And you too. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, another thing actually, um, yeah, we're doing a bunch of work now with the uh, Newell Shearwaters looking at the plastic that they eat and the, their chemistry of their tissues and kind of comparing it to the wedgies, you know? So, um, so I think it would be really fun, yeah, if you were interested in, in something like that, because we have some plastics data also we could share and examples of the plastics they ingest and so forth, you know? Um, yeah, we can get creative. 